Hey, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Not Ephesians. Dr. Jarvis is so happy I got out of that book. He showed up and he said, are you still in Ephesians? I said, no. But he already knew where I was going, so anyway. Hey, good morning. It's good to be back. Pastor James, thank you for preaching last Sunday. Uh, we went away on a simple vacation, uh, and, and it was, it's good to be back. I feel refreshed and renewed and, and just excited about what God's doing and is doing and going to do. And uh, God is good all the time, and I know I can trust Him. Um, I'm doing something a little bit out of my comfort zone. Uh, as you all know, I'm an expository preacher, and I like opening up a book of the Bible and going through a book of the Bible. Uh, but for the next three or four Sundays, uh, we're not going to do that. For the next three or four Sundays, I want to talk to you about about the the truth, or the I guess the understanding of what is the purpose of church. And what is the purpose of fellowship? And, and, and I guess my goal in, in our time together is to really talk about we as Acacia Community Church need to consider small groups. We need to consider that small fellowship of believers as a part of our ministry, as a part of what we're doing here. You know, as Acacia Community Church in, in, in May 2008... Uh, there was a group of us that just just started meeting together in my living room, and, uh, and and it was just a few missionary families that basically we were going out to the village churches, and and trying to just go and worship, but when we would show up quickly, they would say, "Oh, Pastor Terry is here," and so they would take me and my whole family and put us up here on the platform. In, in these big chairs facing everyone. And the whole time we were in church, everyone was staring at you. It's hard to worship being stared at the whole time. Are you getting me? And, and, and so, and then, you know, the pastor of the church, it was always someone that we knew. Oh, Pastor Terry, I'm so glad you're here. Can you preach for us today? And we're like, no, I, I came just to... Don't you have a message ready? Well, sure. But, you know, you're here. And Mama Debbie, will you sing? And, and it was just, you know, oh, children, you come and give a testimony. And so we, we were just really looking, looking. And my son, I, I guess, was maybe 11 or 12 years old then, 13. And he said one day, Dad, you're a preacher. Why don't you just preach to us? And so we started meeting together. In fact, we began listening to CDs of a preacher from America. And then we began, we finished those. And, and so I just began, in fact, the first book we taught from was the book of Hebrews. A long time ago. And uh, went through that book of Hebrews. And then we went to Romans. And, uh, and, and I remember that time of just being together as a body of believers. Fellowshipping together. In my living room. And then a few of our missionary families invited a few more missionary families. And a few more of our missionary families invited a few Ugandan families. And a few more of our Ugandan families invited more Ugandan families. And all of a sudden, there's 60 people in our sitting room. I was all the way against the back wall in the dining like this trying to preach. And people were everywhere. And, uh, and so then we moved out into the yard. Praise God for tropical weather. We moved out into our yard and we met in the side yard. And all of a sudden it grew to 100 people, 150 people. And we're like, man. And there were a few people from that original group who said some things. Well, I remember one person saying, you know, I like that we're growing. But I miss that I don't know everyone now. That's one of the challenges that we face when a church starts to grow. Say amen. And it's true. That's one of the challenges you face as you begin to grow. All of a sudden, our side yard had 200 people. And you're like, man, where did all these people come from? I don't know. I don't even know who they are. And, and, and what happens is when the church gets to be so big, you start losing the ability to connect with one another. 
We start speaking generally, how are you? Good to see you. Glad you're here. And that's about all we have together. And in 2013, we had a major hailstorm. You guys may remember that. The worst hailstorm I've ever seen. And it destroyed all of our shade trees at our house. And we're like, man, we were trying to set up tarps. And we were looking for pieces of property. Everybody, you guys remember that and those that have been around. And, and, and we would set up tarps on Saturday evenings. And get up Sunday morning and the wind had blown them all down. And you have to start again. And, and it was just so frustrating. And in, uh, in February 2013, my wife and I were sitting right here eating Chinese food. This was the Ling Ling restaurant while they were renovating the former Ling Ling at the roundabout. And we were sitting right here and Bosco, the manager, said, Oh, we're going to be opening our new place next week and Jong is coming back. I said, that's wonderful. And I looked at my wife and it was like the light bulb came on and I said, well, what are you guys going to do with this place? He said, I don't know. I said, well, tell, tell John that we're interested to put Acacia Community Church here. And John came back and he met with us and we talked and basically he had already promised this property to someone else for a whole lot more money than we're giving him. Woo, glory, God is good. And he had already promised, in fact, had already even received a very healthy deposit. But in his mind, man, I've always thought it would be a good idea to have a church here. Didn't you say that? I've always thought, man, it would be good to have a church here. I've always thought maybe that's why God even gave me this property, is to have a church here. So all of a sudden, the opportunity is presented to him. Now, you and I know things don't happen fast in Uganda. And by Palm Sunday in March, the third Sunday of March, we had already secured this property and had contracts signed and lease agreements signed and everybody's been happy ever since. Amen? Amen? And so when we moved here in, in March 2013, we were meeting under these eucalyptus trees. You guys remember that? And I was preaching up and down the platform here. It was nice. I had a runway, man. I would take off. And the praise team was right here singing. And everybody was under these trees. And we had a great time. And then we moved to the grass when we had rainy season like this. We would set up in the grass back there. And then we had an idea to build this structure. Because of days like today. Is anyone getting wet? Good. Amen. Praise God. And uh, But we built this structure. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit of, even about the structure. The reason there's this big hole in the middle is I, I had this vision in my mind, and I'm not an engineer. Bob and Sam, you guys have been patient with me. I'm not engineer-minded. And so, in my mind, I said, you know, if we could, if we could have a platform here... And kind of have people sitting all around, facing this way and that way. And so we set up the church that way, built the church that way, and I went to America while it was being built. While I was gone, Paul and Mercy got married. Remember that? What year was that? 2015? 2014. So they got married, and Bob was preaching here. And I came back. And I preached that first Sunday. As again, I'm not, I'm not thinking like an engineer. I thought it would be neat to have a platform right here. But all of a sudden, if you count, and we've actually removed some, as I stood here to try to preach, I felt like I was in a zoo inside of a cage. And all of you were watching me. I thought you were even going to throw peanuts or something, you know? I mean, it was just weird. I said, man, I don't like it. I just didn't like this at all, trying to preach from here and, and trying to look around all these. And plus, it gave you all too many hiding places, you know, to hide out of eyesight. And so, the next week I met with someone. That's a lot. I met with some people that are a lot smarter than I am. 
And they said, well, why don't you just flip the church and put a platform here? And so that's why we have the big hole in the middle. All right? Because, and the guys were like, well, how did you think you were going to be covered? There has to be some kind of pole to cover you while you're standing there. Also, I didn't think about that. It, can God just hold it up? But anyway, so that's why we're where we are in doing what we're doing. Now, I say all of that to say we've grown a lot as Acacia Community Church. Say amen. I, I, now, I want you to understand something. As we've grown physically, I also believe we've grown spiritually. I really believe, listen, there's no way, listen carefully, there's no way you can sit week after week under expository preaching going through books of the Bible, verse by verse, without spiritual growth default. Are you getting me? Just by showing up and hearing it, there's some spiritual growth that takes place. I want to tell you why. Because it's a reference point for many of us. I'll be teaching today from Acts, but then I can refer back to... Do you remember when we were in Ephesians? Do you remember when we were in 1 Peter? You, you see? Or you'll be out somewhere at a Bible study, and someone will open up a Bible and say, Hey, let's look at 2 Peter. you say, Oh! And you may have a few notes there from Pastor Terry. You see, it becomes a reference point. And here's what's happening. By default, many of us are growing spiritually under expository preaching. And that's a wonderful thing. Say amen. I believe it with all my heart. I believe it's what we need to do as a church. However, that meeting, this meeting here on a Sunday morning is wonderful and I'm glad you're here. And I don't want to do anything to keep you from not coming here. I want you to be here. But I realize there's so much more that we need to do. There's so much more that we need to offer you as individual believers. There's so much more that we can do that can allow you to grow spiritually. Now, let's go ahead and look at Acts chapter 2. And, and, and all that was kind of an introduction, but let's just look at Acts 2. And I've got a lot of material I'm going to cover over these next three or four Sundays. And it's probably going to be four or five Sundays now because it's so late today. In fact, this clock was looking good. It was 30 minutes slow. And so they removed it because they knew I would look at it. Because it, I know it's already 12 o'clock or close to it. Shame on you, whoever took that down. I, I was going to go by that clock and just keep going. But let's just look quickly in Acts chapter 2. And let's start in verse 41, please. Those who accepted His message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves, and it literally means they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They continually devoted themselves to the fellowship. They continually devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And they continually devoted themselves to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together. All the believers had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet. Together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes. And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Father, we're glad for this portion of Scripture. We're glad for this foundation that was laid for us to build on. We're thankful for this example of the early church given to us. And I pray this morning that you speak clearly to my heart and through my voice and you give all of us ears to hear what you're saying today. Spirit of God, speak through me. I yield to you. 
Be glorified, Lord Jesus, in our midst. And we pray in your name. Amen and amen. There's a lot of material I can talk about from that section of Scripture. But I want us to focus on a couple of words And the two words I want us to focus on is the fellowship and together. Those two words in that section of Scripture, they committed, continually devoted themselves to the fellowship. And they met together. They met together daily in the temple courts or in the church. And they met together daily from house to house having food. You see, I think some of you who are from the West believe the Baptists invented the potluck. But they did not. It was going on there. They went from house to house and enjoyed the fellowship of believers. And so I want us to just think about a few things this morning. And for the sake of time today, I'm just going to introduce a few things. I really want to preach about a whole lot of things. But today, because of time, and but it is raining... Let me just preach till it stops raining. Is that okay? Okay in the back? Amen there? You guys are not saying anything. They're saying, please, Pastor, no. It stopped already? Oh, no. Now, I just want us to talk about this idea of the fellowship. And we know that word. It's the word koinonia. The noun, the verb is koinonos. And, and, and those words mean, listen carefully, those words mean sharing life together. That's basically what it means. Sharing life together. Now I want us to talk about how we can do that better as Acacia Community Church. How we can do that better as a missionary community, as a Ugandan community. And listen, God has brought us together. How many of you are not from Uganda? Raise your hand. How many of you are not from the West, but also not from Uganda, from another country like Kenyans, Somalians? I mean, we we have people from all over places. We even have a young man from Asia. Huh? I mean, isn't God good? And God has brought us together, listen carefully, as a fellowship. As a community of believers. Now, I believe as your pastor, as your shepherd, I have a responsibility not only to meet with you on Sunday morning. And by the way, listen carefully, the fellowship, the church, is not a spectator event that happens only on Sunday morning. Are you hearing me? The church, the fellowship, is where a community of believers come together to share life with each other. I want you to hear that. We share life with each other. Now, I I can I can just look around and I realize that many of you are involved in small groups. Many of you are involved in meetings during the week with other people who are like minded. And that's wonderful. I want us as a Keisha community to put together a way that we all can meet and have community, not corporately like this. This is going to support the small groups of meeting together. Now, I want you to just listen carefully. In April of 1945, in the Nazi camp of Flossenburg, a pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, many of you have heard of him, he was executed. He was executed by a special order of Heinrich Himmler, who was Hitler's executioner. He had been arrested two years before, and over the period of two years, he had been transferred from prison to prison to prison. And in the moving of Bonhoeffer from place to place, he lost all contact with the outside world. Everyone that he knew was severed from him. He lost, according to his own testimony, the most precious possession that he ever had, fellowship. Fellowship. Bonhoeffer, years years before, wrote a book called Life Together. If you've never read that book, it's a good book. And it's based on Psalms Psalms 133, how blessed it is for people to dwell together in unity. 
He, he wrote that book before his imprisonment, but listen carefully. In the book, this is what he said. Listen, listen, I want you to think. The physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to every believer. A physical sign of the gracious presence of the triune God. How inexhaustible are the riches that open up to those for those who by God's will are privileged to live in the daily fellowship of life with other Christians. He went on to say, listen carefully, let him who has such a privilege thank God on his knees and declare it is grace, nothing but grace that we are allowed to live in fellowship with Christian brothers. Are you hearing me? It's a privilege that we have to be in fellowship with one another. To be able to share life together as a body of believers called Acacia Community Church. And we're made up of a whole group of diverse people. And those are great things. I realize if we sat and talked face to face, heart to heart, many of you don't believe the way I do. And it's okay. We have different ideas. We have different preferences. We have different personalities. We have different thought processes. But folks, I want us to understand something. We have this privilege called the fellowship. You know, the amazing thing to me was Peter preached this message. We know the story of Pentecost. And Peter preached... And he brought clarity. He said, listen, guys, what you're seeing here is Joel chapter 2, the prophecy being fulfilled. Amen. And then he brought the story of who? Jesus. This same Jesus. And they said, what do we need to do? Repent. Now, the amazing thing is, after he preached, what happened? 3,000 souls were saved. Amen. 3,000 souls were were saved and brought into the fellowship. What was the first thing the fellowship did? They started a seminary. No. What was the first thing they did? They started a university. What did they do? The first thing they did as a body of believers, these new with a brand new thought, a brand new process, a brand new way of living, what did they do? They devoted themselves, continually committed themselves to the apostles' teaching, they committed themselves to the fellowship, to sharing life together. This brand new life. Many of them, I'm sure, had families that disowned them. Many of them, I'm sure, were threatened and many of them were killed. Do you see the, real, the realization of the fellowship in that day it was drawing strength and encouragement because your life was threatened as a follower of the way. Are you hearing that? When you stood publicly and said, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm going to be baptized, you were also setting a bullseye on your life for the enemy to attack you and destroy you. How did you have the strength to stand? How did you have the strength you met every day? Now what happened when they met every day? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They had the Old Testament, but the Bible itself wasn't canonized. They didn't have New Testament letters yet. In fact, I was reading just this week that the New Testament came together many times based on the popularity of the letters as they were circulated around to the churches. We need that one. All the churches are really drawing strength from that letter. I don't know if that's true or not, but it made sense to me. That's what they had. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Many, many, uh, Much of it was probably oral. They were just sitting and listening to what the apostles taught us. They were the ones that saw Jesus. They were the ones that moved with Him. They were the ones, John said, we were eyewitnesses. Peter said, we were eyewitnesses. We saw Him. We handled Him. We touched Him. We saw Him raised from the dead. We ate fish with Him on the beach after He was resurrected. Amen? 
we were aware of Him. And so these new followers, they said, listen, we, we've got to be together. We've got to be in this together. We've got to have life together. And so what happened? They, they started devoting themselves to the teaching. Now here's what happens. Listen. When you devote yourself to the teaching of the Word, it brings change in your life. Are you hearing that? When you and I devote ourselves to coming under the teaching of the Word, it brings about change or it brings about growth. You see, Sunday morning as we meet, it's a small step towards spiritual maturity. It's a small part of the process of your personal sanctification. You see, I want you to grow in your spiritual wisdom. I want you to grow in your spiritual strength. I want you to be sanctified, which means I'm set apart from the world, but I'm also set apart for God's glory. I'm His workmanship created for good works. Amen? And so I'm set apart. You see, these believers, they devoted themselves. There was a commitment in that early fellowship. We must come under the apostles' teaching. And we must grow together. We must connect and be together and share life. You know the result of that? Do you see the result in verse 47? The result? And the Lord added daily does your Bible say daily? Woo! Now listen. This is how I believe it happened. As they found this new life in Christ. As they were saved. As the Spirit of God came and worked in them. And saved them. And changed them. As they began to grow. You know what happened? They couldn't keep it to themselves. You see, the fellowship gives us an opportunity to come under the Word. And as the Word changes us, it allows us the opportunity to listen, take what we've learned, and share it out there. Say amen. It strengthens us to talk about some difficult challenges in life. We hear the Word of God, and all of a sudden we realize, wow, there, I, I, there's some things I need to change here. Now, now, do you see, is that picture coming to your mind? Are you all, is it clear? Do you believe that's really the foundation of the fellowship in Acts 2? Do you kind of see that's how it happened? Shake your head. This is yes in Chimaka. Uh, are we together? Now, now listen, I want to ask a question then. Is that really the picture of the fellowship today? Is that really what we see in the fellowship today? You see, there's a challenge I have, and I just want to say this with the Western church. There's a real challenge I have, and I believe that's coming here also in the African church, is we've decided as the church to give people what they want. Are you, are you getting that? Now, I say that because instead of giving them the apostles' teaching, instead of giving them Bible truth, we compromise. And we give them what they want. Paul prophesied that it's going to happen in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The time is going to come. When people will not endure sound, healthy teaching. But listen, they will gather around them a great number of teachers. That will say what their itching ears want to hear. So they gather around those kind of teachers and they turn away from sound doctrine. You see, the, the great truth about sound doctrine is it brings about change in a person's life. As sound, healthy teaching is presented, it changes us. And I want to be changed. Now, how does it change me? It hopefully makes me more like Jesus. 
Say amen. I said it changes me to make me to be more like Jesus. I want you to be more like Jesus. Is that your goal? Is that Should that be a desire of all of us? I just want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to be like Terry. I want to be like Jesus. I think it was John the Baptist that said, He must increase and I must decrease. You see, that's the goal. That's what happens when community comes together. And the result is, it changes us in such a way that our lives become, we become encouraged and strengthened to send one another out. To send one another out to share the truth of this gospel, the truth of this message. You know, if, uh, if I could just give you a, a couple of words here. You see, community, the fellowship. Here, here's what we're going to be talking about over these next weeks. We're going to be talking about what it really means to connect. And, and, and connecting is basically the process where we're going to develop relationships. Are you listening? With an identified group of people. All right? We're going to have groups of people that we're going to identify with and we're going to connect with and we're going to share life with. Okay? Now, what happens when that takes place is change. You see, the change takes place because basically, here's the truth, change is I become more like Jesus. That's it. That's all it is. The purpose of small groups, the purpose of... of Gathering together in these small groups is that we become more like Jesus. We share life to encourage you to be more like Jesus. And then we start cultivating. And that's the process of helping the group members. Listen, the process of helping the group members to serve other people and to share their faith. To serve others and to share their faith. It's that simple. And I see that really, you you look at it, I mean, it's the pattern of the fellowship in Acts 2. The fellowship, verse 44, they were together. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet. They were connecting, they were growing. In verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were changing. There was spiritual growth. There was change taking place. And then the Lord added. There was cultivation. The Lord added. As they met together and they grew, there was an addition that took place. You know, I I just want to close with something that's been on my heart since Thursday. Is it okay? And uh, and And I want to talk to you about this. This is an iPhone 5. Is it a 5? Yeah, it's an iPhone 5. And I know very little about these things. But I noticed, I really saw something on Thursday. You see, this small window here causes us to lose community causes us to lose relationships causes us not to be together any longer Uh, you go to any restaurant you go to any place and see a group of people and there's very little conversation except hey watch this video right here Now, I'm just saying, listen, here's what's happened. This small window, listen carefully, has caused many of you to live a secret life. You don't want to connect to real people. Because here, you're a hero. I tweet, I am. Here, you've you've got your own... You know, listen, some of you don't like my preaching. 
And you say, well, it doesn't matter. I can just get an e-message here. I can just go and, and listen to somebody from that preaches what my preferences are. Some of you don't like the music style here. It's okay. I can just go on iTunes and listen to my own music. I don't need the church. I don't need the community. I don't need the fellowship. I want to tell you that's a lie. We were made to need each other. I, I just, it's really, now, I, and I, I, listen, if I point one finger at you, there's three pointing back at me. I'm three times as guilty as you. There's times my wife sighs when she walks in the room and I'm on my Facebook like this. She says, that's why I don't do Facebook. She'll, if you're with her for an hour, you'll hear that at least once. I don't do Facebook. She says, I, I want faces. I want real people. You see? Now, I, I say that because here's, here's the challenge of the fellowship. You see, let me, just, let me just read my notes because if I don't, I'll... I just want to read something. Is it okay? Listen. As Christ's church, we are one wife in Scripture with one husband. We are one set of branches connected to one vine. We are one flock with one shepherd. We are one king with one kingdom. We are one family with one father. We are one building with one foundation. But I want to tell you something. What's so awesome about the New Testament, how it's introduced to us, we are the body of Christ, is one body, with one life source, Jesus Christ being our head. That's who we are. That's the church. And there's so many things. Listen, there's so many things today that are trying to change that. Trying to get us away from being connected. Today, listen, as I've told you already, I believe the purpose of church and the purpose of us meeting is there's the gradual growth. This process of sanctification is a gradual growth. Uh, ordinary means of grace and prayer and the Word of God. But today I, I'm seeing fellowship has been exchanged for some kind of radical experience. Looking for some kind of extreme. Church is not an event for you to come and watch. Are you hearing that? It's a shared life. It's a practical, practicing fellowship of believers. It's a partnership. It's critical to the life of any church that's going to be successful. Are you hearing that? It's critical, this fellowship. And I, I just want us to understand. Don't let anything rob you of the fellowship of believers. Don't let anything take away from that. If we have small groups, when you're involved in a small group, leave your phones at home. Are you getting that? I was talking to Pastor Andrew yesterday. And he said, you know, you think about it, Pastor. We're sitting in church like this and your phone beeps telling you you have a message. At the moment you hear that beep, I lose you. You may not check your phone immediately, but you're thinking, I wonder who that is. Is that important? I wonder what they want. I hope everything's okay. I wonder if that's from America. I wonder what's going on. Oh my goodness, I need to check it. And within a few minutes, you're digging in your purse, you're digging in your pockets, and you're like this. And for those minutes, you've lost connection. You see, this little window, this little screen allows you to be disconnected. And for some people, they like that. But I'm telling you, that's not God's design or desire for you and I as His sheep. We need to stay connected. And it's a tool that's used for good. But it's also a tool that's used for disconnection. That's used for you to enter your own private 
life. Will, I need to send you home. Let me close with these thoughts. Our culture today is becoming more isolated, more self absorbed, more narcissistic than I've ever seen. And it's mostly because of this small screen here. Today's church, unfortunately, is trying to give the culture what it wants privacy, low commitment, unaccountability, convenience. Preferences have taken over. Whether it's a preference of music or preaching style or some kind of entertainment. There will be those who won't be a part of Acacia Community Church. Because when the preaching and teaching of the Word takes place and it's used to ask someone to change, they don't want it. It makes them uncomfortable. So we can just run and have our e-service. I don't need him. I can just listen to an iPod cast. What's it called? A podcast, yeah. One of those. It's a real challenge. And and as I told you, I, I, I was really convicted of it on Thursday. And I'm not here to tell you to don't have electronics. But I'm here to invite you not to allow the electronics to cause you to be disconnected from real people, real relationships, real accountability. Are we together? Let's stand for a prayer. Next week, uh, I want you to come back next week and I want to talk further about the change that takes place as the fellowship meets together. We're going to talk about the truth and the reality of change that I can't make by myself and you can't make by yourself. But as iron sharpens iron, so a friend can sharpen the countenance of another friend. We can sharpen one another. And that's the purpose of the fellowship. To encourage one another. Remember when we started Acacia? We said we exist for three reasons. To establish you in your faith. To help you to know what you believe. To equip you for your own mission to give you Bible truth that you can apply in your own mission where you are, where you're serving but also to encourage you in the journey I want you to be encouraged and and we can be encouraged for 45 minutes on a Sunday listening to me speak I hope it does encourage you but there's so much more there's so much more that we can do that we need to do Because it's tough. It's tough. But together we can make it. Together we can be strengthened and encourage one another. So Lord, we thank You for this morning. We thank You for Your Word.